Over the past two weeks, I've been spotlighting various black voices to learn as much as I can during these insane times. Uh, my guest tonight is a very talented comedian and actor who has carved his own unique path through the entertainment industry. He's also one of the most loving fathers I know. Uh, his new show, Nice One, will be premiering later this summer on Quibi. Please welcome my really good friend, Ron Funches. Ron, good to see you. Hey, Coco. How are you doing? How dare you call me Coco? <laughs> How dare you disrespect me? <laughs> you know, we have so much to talk about. Um, obviously, the last two weeks has been so many things. It's been uh, traumatic and upsetting uh, and uh, at times violent. And th there's, I mean, I think that what, what good is coming out of it is that there's been a lot of discussion. And we've been, we've been trying to do that uh, here on the show. One of the things I wanted to talk to you about is that uh, when, when you saw what happened to George Floyd, I'm sure this brought up a lot of feelings about your own son, uh, your, your son who uh, has, you've worried about, you've wor you say that, uh, you've told me in, in the past that you, about your son and about your son's uh, autism, Mm -hmm. and that this has been a specific concern of yours for his safety out in the world. Is that true? Yeah, absolutely. It's been a concern of mine for many years. It's one of my most motivating things in my life. Um, just that because of him being mixed race, being half black and half white and having autism and not being, you know, he just doesn't follow directions as easily. He doesn't respond to directions as quickly as some people would like. And I was always concerned that, that if he was in an altercation with a police officer, that that could mean the end of his life. Um, so it was something that was deeply concerned to the point where, you know, I, I didn't necessarily like him out of my sight that much. I didn't, and a lot of my um, motivation was trying to insulate that with money being like, okay, if we can surround him in a good neighborhood, if we can surround him with, uh, with a nanny that's there, even though he's 17 years old, we have a full-time nanny just to make sure that someone is with him. And it is not because he's not independent. He's very independent. It's a lot to do with my fear about what could happen with misunderstandings with others, especially people like the police, people with power. Yeah. And, and you know, I was talking... Uh, yesterday uh, to the mayor uh, of, of St. Paul, Minnesota, and we were talking about this, this concept that maybe uh, in some situations you don't, it, it shouldn't be automatic that the police are called, that it might be some sort of health workers that are called for some situations so that response is a little more nuanced. And that's something you've thought about with your son, which is, you know, you don't necessarily want the police showing up uh, no. if if you're having an issue with your son. No, and that that really says a lot right there. That if you are in a bad situation, if you're if if things are feeling out of control, like you you don't want the police because the fear is that they will escalate the situation. Their job is usually to just try to get the peace and order as quick as possible. And if that means removing a situation, if that means they have to shoot someone, it seems like that is a quicker option to them than trying to figure out what the problem is, trying to be empathetic to what the problem is. Um, it's something I dealt with when my son was younger, when he was five, six, seven years old, and he would be overwhelmed by different stimulus. He would have these big tantrums, and it would involve people calling the police to my house. And I was lucky that it never escalated, um, but it did end up with like, you know, no one ever came over and say, hey, what can we do to help? What What's the issue was going on? Instead, they would come over, they would tell us to shut it down and shut him up. And then they would call child services and then we'd have to deal with that. It was always like, you're a bad parent or you don't know what you're doing as opposed to you need help. And I think that's something where health services and, and people trained in that can be much more helpful, especially dealing with anyone with any type of mental diversity or disability. Um, you don't want someone who's not familiar with that coming into the situation. I believe that your son Malcolm is named after Malcolm X. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. It's interesting because 
when I look at the actual footage of Malcolm X, he's the most one of the most charismatic person that people I've ever seen uh, it, it captured in documentary footage. He's got that same thing that Muhammad Ali had, where he can just he's such a powerful presence and he can enrapture so, you. Yeah, exactly. Is when did you when did you I mean, obviously, if you named your son Malcolm, it must have been an important figure to you. Is this your whole life? Uh, it started probably around when I was 11, 12 years old. When I was getting ready to leave Chicago. Um, one of the best things that my school ever did for me was take me to go see the autobiography of Malcolm X with starring Denzel Washington. And mm -hmm. that um, kind of started my infatuation with him. And then I read his autobiography. And mm -hmm. then I started to read more speeches that he had done. And then it, it became clear to me that like this was a guy who had become marginalized by history as this like just black separatist that all his stuff was about like you know separating black people from white people and that was then that was not the truth it was all about black love and pride and a lot of it was just about power and and oppression and and unionizing and, and healthcare he talked about a lot of things about unionizing and healthcare that are still needed to this day that we don't deal with and and i think it's it's so funny that people go back and and they they glorify rightfully so martin luther king um but they also whitewash his history he he was not as he was more militant than people think and malcolm x was less militant than people think right. um they both just talked about they were like two sides of a coin that were headed to the same direction and i think um you know, now they, they invoke Martin Luther King's name to kind of pacify us, to kind of say, um, you're supposed to just march and speech. And, you know, that's what Martin do. And if you don't do that, you're disrespecting Martin Luther King. And it's just like, I don't want to hear that from when he was on the FBI's most wanted list, when he was murdered by our government, when those are things that now they celebrate him when they did his, the damnedest to discredit him, to to... to Say that he was a womanizer and to to kill him and then now you know they want to tell another story right right one of the things that i'm uh you know i, I don't think i was unaware of this but um but I, what i'm hearing again and again from from friends of mine uh is uh, who are black is that they've um they say that they experience racism sometimes, but it's almost uh, uh, at a frequency that their white friends don't pick up on it, but black people pick up on it. And it's something that you're quite familiar with. You'll be in a situation where something might happen and you'll feel, wait a minute, that didn't feel right to me, but your white friends who you think are pretty woke uh, don't, don't hear it. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Yeah, that it is true. It's, it's, seems to be um, just operation, uh, how do I put it? It just seems you have to prove it to them. They, if they don't see it firsthand, if it's not someone calling you the N-word, if it's not someone throwing you to the ground, I think that's what made the George Floyd situation so unavoidable, that you could look at it directly and you see the smugness, you see the lack of empathy, you see the fact that he has his knee on the back of a person's neck which is not needed for any situation so you couldn't avoid it but a lot of other things you can avoid a lot of the things that people would come to me and be like well maybe you misheard or maybe you just picked up the wrong tone or maybe you had a bad day um and i've been lucky that like like my best of friend my friend gabe who features for me he he's been more open to it be, and it's probably because he had a black stepdad for a while he had a lot of black members in his family and i remember recently we were traveling and we just stopped in this airport for coffee and then the guy was was giving out coffee to people and the, the my friend was before me and he talks to my friend he's like hey good morning how's everything going how's how's your day where are you headed to and he gets to me and he doesn't say a word to me he just i just order he gives me my coffee and he shuts completely down and then the next person that comes by is a white lady and he's back to the same and so then i was like oh okay i get it and then i was fortunate at that time that my friend was there to look over and go oh that guy's a He's a racist. And um, 
sometimes that's what you need. It's not necessarily that that ruined my day or I cared that much about that coffee. I have learned to the situation of like, I'm just passing through. If that's how he's living and he's having a horrible day and he's racist, well, then that's where he belongs, just serving coffee out in the middle of nowhere. I'm passing through. But what sometimes that we need is just validation, just knowing that, hey, even if you didn't see it, even if you don't want to believe it, it happens. And you got to take people's words for it. I think that's the thing that I've been seeing the most is that like the African-American community is the only group that has to prove that they didn't deserve to die, you know? They, we have to explain why, oh, what did he do? Why you get something? Oh, well, he, he George Floyd had a record. He did this 2007, he did this 2009. It's like, there's no other race, there's no other group that you'd have to explain why you don't deserve to be murdered. Yeah, yeah. You and I went on a tour uh, a year ago, a little over a year ago, and we spent a lot of time together and so was there anything that happened uh, while we were on that tour together that, that made you feel at all strange or feel marginalized while we were on the road together or on different tours? Um, on, on some different tours, definitely. I wouldn't say there was any event that happened on our tour. I would say the only thing that I was aware of is that I had this mindset that, um, if I strayed too far from the group that some people might be like, Oh, what are you doing? Where are you, who, like, where are you, are you trying to get into this? Like, are you, are you like trying to rob them? Or are you trying, like, you don't belong here basically. Wait, where did this, where did you feel this? It, it, it's a feeling that I carried that I'm, I, that I should not get too far from the group that I should had to show them that I was with you. Right. Because if I felt that if I was alone, they'd go, oh, why are you in this fancy hotel? Why are you here? What are you doing here? And that happens to me more on like, because I love to travel. I love the vacation. And that's happened to me several times on vacation or several times in, in nice stores where I would, I used to do this thing that if they treat me poorly, I'd buy more stuff so that I proved to them you were wrong. And now I, I was like, no, I'm just not going to make sure you just don't get that commission. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're saying is in order to prove that that you were there with good intent, you would like buy a canoe, even if you didn't want a canoe. Yes. I'll take the canoe. <laughs> That's the strangest response to feeling marginalized. <laughs> but you, it's not. You see it a lot of time. It's called peacocking. It's it's something that is happens in the black community where you see a lot of like fancy cars, fancy clothes, because it's this showcase of like, hey, you shouldn't treat me poorly instead of it being like, I'm a human, so you shouldn't treat me poorly. It used, you know, and that, that's one of the biggest lessons I learned as a young black man is that I thought for some strange, dumb reason, I thought like, oh, if I get a little bit of money, then they'll stop treating me like this. And then I learned that that wasn't the case. <laughs> So you'll be on a, I mean, you've done very well. You'll be on a vacation. You'll be staying in a nice place. And you'll sometimes sense that people are wondering, how is he here? What's he doing here? Is he a guest of this hotel? I've had it happen. I've had um, a bellhop try to stop me from entering my own hotel room because I went outside for a jog and I come back in my shorts and I'm sweaty. And he's just like, hey, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And then I, I have headphones on, so I'm not even paying attention. So I just go walking by and he starts following me and yelling at me. He's like, who are you? What are you doing here? So I just turn around and I show him my key card and then I flip him off. <laughs> that, was that was the end of that. Right, right. I'm, gl I'm glad you, you had the correct response. I'm glad <laughs> you were able to do that. Um, there's this belief some people have that racism uh is there's a that it's a generational aspect to racism that uh that it's it's worse with older generations but as we move on and people get younger and and newer generations come along it's getting better um that has not always been your experience right no not always um i mean i do believe that there is always progress and it's i think the more that we become culturally mixed the more that these kids have grown up off of hip-hop and have seeing black people in positions of power and representation the better it gets 
But no, I have no plenty. You you turn on a game of Call of Duty, you turn on any video game, and it's not your grandpa calling me the N-word, you know? It's a 12-year-old kid, it's a 13-year-old kid. You see it at these these Trump rallies. They're not 80-year-old people. Right, right. They're 20-year-old white men who have found a way to make themselves feel disenfranchised and make right. themselves feel like the victim and, and use that that national that white pride and that racism to fuel themselves. So it, to me, that's one of the biggest disservice we do as a community is going, oh, well, we just need to wait 10, 20 years for our grandparents to die. Right. And it's right. like, well, we've been waiting 100 years for that. Right. So those grandparents teach the kids who teach the grandkids. And, and it, you got to look within yourself. It's not just about your parents. You have a very unique comedic voice and style. And it's something I always really admired about you. And yet at the same time, I'm, I'm imagining it's been a struggle for you to not get typecast because of the color of your skin. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I knew that from my first when I went to Montreal was a new face. Uh, a gentleman, Brendan Johnson, who's a great African-American comedian and actor, came up to me and he was like, oh, I saw your set. He's like, I'm just, he's like, you're weird and you're black. Your road's going to be different and longer and, and strange, but keep being you. Don't ever change for these people. And I've always kept that. And it, it's been a source of anger and frustration for me that my comedy is built off of uh, love, it's built off of empathy, it's built out of optimism, it's built off of making the best of a bad situation. And a lot of times the roles that, that are offered to me are that of a gang member, or that of a guy fresh out of jail, or that of a guy where I have to um, change the way I speak to speak more urban, to to fit into a role that they want me to fit into. And I just don't feel that that's fair, especially in this time period. They, you know, it, it, we still, representation, I think, is one of the biggest things. Laws are going to be very important, just not police brutality, obviously, is, is a step, is a great step. But representation and being willing to show different facets of the Black community it's something that we still struggle with every day, every pilot season. I get just more and more sitcoms where either it's a struggle role of a black guy lifting himself out of poverty, or it's a, clearly a white role that they're trying to shoehorn some diversity into. And there's just multiple black stories and multiple types of way that people can be viewed in the community. And that's something I try to write towards and try to create because I don't, like the roles that I'm offered, basically. Mm -hmm. The um, I know that uh, there was a, you've you've been on my show many times. Always been hilarious. You did stand up on my show once, and I know there was a joke you wanted to do, or that you were planning to do, and the joke involved you using the N word. And um, I don't think I was aware of this at the time, I, uh, but our one of our producers said, "Well, you can't say that word." on Turner Broadcasting. So we were in the position of being white and telling you, you can't use the N word, which was just sort of a weird situation. Um, was that something that bothered you when that happened? Uh, of course it bothered me a little bit, but it wasn't something that I didn't expect. <laughs> and you know, I was like, let me attempt to do this joke because I love it. And again, I think it shows my style of, of someone who looks at for the positive in every negative situation. Um, but I didn't expect you guys to let me say the N-word on TV. So um, I wasn't mad about it. But I, you know, when you look at it, you go like, this is just a, a weirder form of oppression where you where there's right. a guilt about this word that, you know, that we've taken as a black community to as a source of empowerment for us. And then they go like, well, okay, well, now that you guys don't hate it as much, you can't say it. <laughs> Can I can I hear the joke or can we hear the joke? Yeah, I can just tell you. I mean, I don't remember it 100% because it was years ago, but it, I remember the event. It was just about the time I was going to go get my son a, a Papa Murphy's Take and Bake Pizza. We was walking across my apartment, across this two-lane big street that we had. And as I was going across the street, I hear this guy yell out, hey, use the crosswalk N-word. And it pissed me off because I was like, oh, man, like there's so much racism in the world. Everybody's full of hatred. I'm just trying to go get my son a pizza but then i thought oh yeah 
he's in a car. Maybe I just didn't hear the rest of the conversation. He, what he was trying to say was, use the crosswalk, nigga. I'm worried about your safety. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good joke. <laughs> You're always able to see the silver lining, I guess, huh? Yes, I try. <laughs> <laughs> He's worried about my safety. <laughs> um, you know, you've uh you've uh we've hung out a lot. We've spent a lot of time together. We've been in vans, we've been on planes, we've been backstage. Uh I'm I'm trying to figure out as best I can how I can um, you know, how I can learn and how I can grow and evolve. And so if you have advice for me, I'll take it. Sure. Um, I was thinking about this last night because um, you, I think a lot of people are in your position. A lot of white people are in your position where they're, they're this is new to them. <laughs> <This> is, <laughs> mm -hmm. Which right. is hilarious to us. <laughs> but um I appreciate you trying to look in, but I think a lot of it is like, look, don't be so egotistical. It's not about you. It's not, right, it's, right, it's right. about us. It's yep. about um, the things that we're going to and the fact that you can be listened and open to that is great. But I thought I did a little bit more thinking and I thought the best thing I could tell you is just be an active ally. Um, be, if you see you're in a, privileged position that sometimes white people will reveal their racism to you because you're white and they don't think that you might have an issue with it or you, they might feel more comfortable with revealing their true selves to you as opposed to me, you know? And I think if you are in that position and you see that, to never let that go, to never right. to always right. check people if they are in that position and you see them acting out of line or treating someone poorly, to n never let them know that that is okay. That mm -hmm. that is the thing that is the best thing that you can do. Okay, okay. I have had the experience over the years of African Americans, Black people. Whenever I see them and they're familiar with my show, they always say the same thing: "You're crazy." <laughs> yeah. No, what, Black people <laughs> love you. For as white and lily white as you are, you are loved in the black community. I think it's because you are so awkwardly tall and look like an outcast yourself. Uh, <laughs> they always say the same thing. They start laughing and they say, you're crazy. You're yes. crazy. Yes. <laughs> that always, and actually it's a nice way to start the conversation, uh, <laughs> you know, which, uh, which, which, which works out. Um, well, I, uh, I really appreciate you coming on the show and having this conversation with me. And uh, I want to apologize again for on tour, um, singing songs towards you with my acoustic <laughs> guitar, when I think I knew it drove you crazy. But <laughs> I literally love to be like, <laughs> it's me at my absolute whitest, which is, so white and I would see you and I'd be like, I'm gonna do it again. And you you were very vocal about how you considered it a unique form of torture. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but that's what I love about our, uh, our relationship is that I can say, I can tell you that. I can, oh, I can say that. Guess what? You didn't just tell me that. You then went out in front of, I don't know, 3000 people in a giant venue and you told them the most horrible thing just happened to me. Conan was <laughs> backstage playing his guitar. <laughs> and he, you made fun of me brutally in front of all these people and I loved it. It was absolutely hilarious. It needed I had to be done. So. You know, I figured if it happened to me that much, it must happen to your staff all the time. So I needed to stand up for them. <laughs> You did the right thing. You did the, the right thing. Uh, well, thank you so much for doing this. I love you. Uh, I can't wait till we get to hang out in person. And um, and thank you so much uh, for doing this today. You're a good man. Thank you. Uh, I love you too. I appreciate you doing this. This is a, a great thing that you're doing. And um, I think I like that you're looking into yourself, but you've always, you've, you've done a great job. You've hired diverse, a lot of diversity. The fact that you had Dion Cole on your show when I was a young man, 
um, meant a lot to me as a young black comedian because it was one of the few guys where I was like, oh, this is not, he's not doing a stereotype. He's not doing a shtick. He's a weird black dude doing himself. And you mm -hmm. gave him a platform to show that. And, yeah. and, and then in turn, that empowered me. Yeah, he's such a funny guy and, and you're such a funny guy. And uh, well, I'll see you soon. I promise you'll never hear me sing again. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> See, if all I do is if that, if I can grow that much, I can grow more. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Ron, and I'll talk to you soon.